Okay, in this video we're going to look at a super important result known as the first isomorphism theorem for groups. So there exist these kind of isomorphism theorems for all algebraic structures, but in this video we'll just focus on groups. So let's look at some background. So let's say G1 and G2 are groups, and we have a map phi from G1 to G2. We say that's a homomorphism if for all x in G1, we have phi of xy equals phi of x times phi of y. So here the multiplication is happening in G1, and here the multiplication is happening in G2. Okay, now next, we say the kernel of phi is the set made up of all x in the domain, g1, that get mapped to the identity in the codomain. So this is phi of x equals e2, which is the identity in g2. And notice that that's just the inverse image of this homomorphism phi. And previously, in a previous video, we proved that this, in fact, was a normal subgroup of g1. So since it's a normal subgroup of G1, you might ask, well, what is the quotient group of G1 with the kernel? And that's exactly what this first isomorphism theorem deals with. So let's say we've got a homomorphism from G to H. And so we've got a group G here and a group H here. And then the projection homomorphism from G to G mod the kernel then there exists a unique isomorphism, which we'll call psi, which goes from G mod the kernel up to the image of phi, which it's easy to show that that is a subgroup of H. And in fact, this, all of these things interact in the following way. We have psi um, pi equals phi. And so there we have a composition on the left, and then we have our original homomorphism on the right. And so I've detailed this down here with a picture, and this picture is gonna give us an idea for how to do the proof. So notice we've got our original homomorphism here um, going from G to the image of phi. Notice I've made it a surjection onto the image of phi, which is a subgroup of H. Often we'll start off with a surjective homomorphism, but we'll talk about that later. And then we have G going down here. So this is another um, surjection just the normal projection homomorphism from G to a quotient. And then finally, this is our um, isomorphism that, that is brought into existence by this theorem. Okay, so let's kind of see how this works. So we'll start with X, an element from G, and now phi maps this over this way via phi of X. And then um, pi maps this guy down this way to the coset x kernel phi. So remember, elements from G mod the kernel are given by uh, x kernel phi, that coset. But what that tells us, since we want this to happen, this uh, psi pi to be phi, in other words, this diagram needs to be commutative, then that means psi needs to send x kernel phi up to phi of x. And that's exactly how we're going to start the proof. Okay, I'm going to clean up the board except for the statement of this theorem, and then we'll work on the proof. Okay, so motivated by our picture, we can uh, work through our proof. So we want to define psi in the following way. We want to say that it is a map from G mod the kernel of phi, so that's some sort of quotient group, ending at H, in other words, at the image of phi in H. And uh, it will be given in the following way. So it needs to take a coset, X kernel, kernel phi and send it to phi of x. And now notice this is going to be an element from the image of phi, which is a subgroup of h. Okay, great. Now the first thing that we need to check is that this is well defined. And uh, I remember when I was first learning this class, I was never really sure when things needed to be checked, if they were well defined or not. But a good way to think about it is you want to look at elements from your domain and you want to ask, are there different names for these elements? And here there are. Since we're inside a quotient, there's always different names for the same coset. Um, 
there's a really useful result that says when cosets are the same and they may have different representatives and those representatives are like different names here. So in other words, in this case, we do have to check that it's well-defined because we are in some sort of quotient structure. So what we want to do is we want to suppose that X kernel of phi equals Y kernel of phi. In other words, we have the same coset with two different names, X and Y, and then we want to show that when we apply psi to both sides, we will in fact get the same thing. Okay, but if x kernel of phi is equal to y kernel of phi, that tells us that x y inverse is an element from the kernel of phi. So again, that's from that very, very useful proposition involving um, when cosets are equal. Um, but now what we can do is use the fact that if something is in the kernel, it gets mapped to the identity. So this tells us that phi of x, um, y inverse, is equal to the identity in h. So I'll just call that e. But now we can apply uh, the homomorphism rule here, and that tells us that phi of x times phi of y inverse is equal to the identity in H. But that tells us that phi of x equals phi of y, just uh, right multiplying by phi of y. But notice phi of x is the same thing as psi x kernel of phi. And phi of y is the same thing as psi y kernel of phi. So now we read the extreme left-hand side and right-hand side of this final equation. And what we've shown is that two elements with different names that have the same um, identity are mapped to the same place under our um, new function phi. So in other words, it is well-defined. Okay, great. So now I'll clean up the board and we'll check everything else that we need to check in order for this to be an isomorphism. Okay, so we have this map psi which takes the coset x kernel phi to phi of x. We just proved that that was a well-defined function. The next thing we need to do is check that it's a homomorphism. Okay, so in order to do that, we need to look at uh, psi of x kernel phi y kernel phi. So notice here in the parentheses, we are inside the quotient group g mod the kernel of phi. So we're combining cosets by the coset group operation of the quotient group. So, but we can do that, and that gives us uh, psi acting on xy kernel of phi. Okay, good. But that's going to give us uh, psi, um, sorry, that's going to give us phi of xy by the definition of psi, but that's going to give us uh, phi of x times phi of y, but that will give us uh, psi acting on x kernel phi and uh, psi acting on y kernel phi. Okay, good. But then again, if we look at the extreme left-hand side and the extreme right-hand side, what we have done is we have factored this multiplication that's happening inside the domain into a multiplication that's happening inside the codomain. Okay, great. Now the next thing I want to do is show that this thing is injective. Okay. So uh, we'll use the fact that... Um, a homomorphism is injective if and only if its kernel is trivial. So let's go ahead and suppose that um, x kernel of phi is inside the kernel of psi. So it looks like there's lots of uh, uses of the word kernel there, but remember here we've got a coset x kernel of phi, and over here we're talking about like the set, which is the kernel of the homomorphism, homomorphism psi, homomorphism psi, homomorphism psi, homomorphism psi. Okay, great. But now, in order to be in that kernel, that means if you apply psi to this side, you get, um, you get the identity in H. 
But now notice that the definition of this is uh, phi of x. And so in other words, we have phi of x equals the identity. But what that tells us is that x is in the kernel of phi. Okay, but what that tells us is that the coset x kernel phi is the same thing as the coset identity kernel phi. In other words, the coset, which is just the normal subgroup itself, which is the identity inside the quotient group. So, in other words, the kernel of psi is exactly equal to the coset, which is the kernel of phi. And I should maybe put this in braces. And remember, uh, the coset, which is the kernel of phi, is the identity in this quotient group. And so we have a trivial kernel for psi. We have the only thing that has to be in there. So in other words, it's injective. Okay, so we've got that it's a homomorphism. We've got that it's injective. Now we just have to show that it's surjective. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is show that this is surjective. And now notice by saying it's surjective, it needs to be surjective onto the image of phi. So uh, let's suppose we have some y in the image of phi, and we want to find something that is mapped onto that y. But the fact that we're in the image of phi, what that tells us is that there exists an x in G such that um, phi of x equals y. Okay, great. But now all we have to do is notice that if we take the coset um, x kernel of phi, that's going to be sent to phi of x which is equal to y. So in other words, what we've done is we've started with an arbitrary um, element from our codomain. Remember, our codomain is restricted to the image of phi here. And we have found an element that gets mapped on to that element from the codomain um, by our would-be isomorphism. So in other words, this thing is surjective. Okay, so we showed that it's well-defined. In other words, it's a function in the first place. It's a homomorphism. It's injective and surjective. So what that tells us is that it is an isomorphism. Okay, so now there's a couple of other things to check. Even though we have an isomorphism in this case, what we need to check is that it is a unique isomorphism morphism and that it satisfies this rule. So I'll clean up the board and we'll check those two things. Okay, so if we recall that our map takes uh, x kernel phi to phi of x, well then it's actually very, very easy to show that this is true because x kernel phi is exactly pi of x. So now we can rewrite this as psi of pi of x equals phi of x. And that actually proves this uh, statement right here. Okay, great. So now we've got that rule over there. Now we just need to show that this thing is unique. So how we'll do that is let's suppose that we have another isomorphism that satisfies this rule. So in other words, maybe we have uh, psi bar, um, which is an isomorphism from g mod the kernel of phi. So I'll note that it's an isomorphism by putting a little squiggle over there, and it goes up to the image of phi uh, such that um, psi bar satisfies this other rule. So psi bar um, of pi um, equals phi. Okay, so now let's take an element x um, kernel phi from the quotient group g mod kernel phi. And what we want to show is that psi bar agrees with psi um, on this element. In other words, these will be the same maps. And so now let's notice that uh, psi bar on x kernel phi is exactly equal to psi bar of pi of x because this bit in here is just pi of x uh, by what we said before. But now this is exactly phi of x. 
And we know that that is true because uh, psi bar has to satisfy this uh, functional equation. But now this is going to give us the same thing as psi of pi of x. Again, because our original isomorphism satisfies that rule. But that's exactly psi of x kernel phi. So now let's go ahead and look at the extreme left and right hand side of the equation and notice that means that psi bar evaluated an arbitrary element of our quotient group equals psi evaluated at that arbitrary element of our quotient group. In other words, psi bar has to be equal to psi. Um, okay, great. So now we've proven everything we need to prove, and this is a good place to end the video. We'll do a follow-up video with, video with a ton of examples of applications of this theorem.